Because the thing I know about people, people can talk to talk. And people do it very well. But life is going to hit you with a certain level of opposition. Life is going to hit you with a certain level of adversity. And life is going to say to you, you said you wanted it. Now let's see how bad you really want it. Hello, humans. Welcome to The M Word, the Manx Sport Podcast, brought to you by Martin. That's me. And Matt. That's him. Welcome back, Matthew. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. And yourself? Good, 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 good. <laughs> Excited. Uh, we're joined by our guest who will bring in our studio in a few moments' time. Uh, first of all, we just want to give a quick uh, thank you to our sponsor, Billboards.im. They do exactly what it says on the tin, which is billboard advertisement, digital advertising. You'll have seen it around the Isle of Man. Uh, it's the future of advertising, so give the guys a shout and uh, get your brand out there with those guys. And they're obviously uh, helping us immensely with our, our project as well. So thanks, guys. So in a moment, we're going to be joined by our guest, uh, before before I do that, I just want to chat, Matt. Just on the intro, came in there. You've heard a, a voice as we normally do. Mm. Uh, you're probably not familiar with it. A gentleman called Inky Johnson. Come across that name? Can't say I have no. no. <laughs> so so Inky he was a college uh, American football player and was about ten games away from making it pro in the NFL. Right. Uh, come through a hard life, uh, and his whole focus in his career had been about uh, making it and eventually, obviously, to support his family, etc. Uh, ten games away from making a career of it, he had uh, he went into a tackle, uh, badly damaged his arm, which ended up being limp, uh, and really ended his career before it even started. And his dream of uh, supporting his family, he you can find him on YouTube oh. if you if you Google it, if you Google yeah. him, you find him on YouTube. Uh, but, but what's interesting about his he's a motivational speaker now. What what you what's really interesting when I listen to him, he reminded me uh, his, his sort of tagline in it all is when he's when he's on stage talking about. Uh, the incident he talks about is his arm which he has as an bandage and he talks about his arm being a badge mm-hmm. of honour so that he uses that as motivation for his uh, for what he does day to day in his life and, and it's it's that really that badge of honour yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which really rolled me into a, uh, our guest today who is uh, just joined us in the studio is Sam Brand so Sa- Sam uh, is for those locals I'm sure have heard of him is a pro cyclist and uh, has type 1 diabetes uh, rides for a team and very much the team is about diabetes awareness and really rolls into that wearing that uh, badge of honor really to, to talk about that subject and, and and use that to to help people with that situation so thanks for joining us today sam thank no, you thank you thank you for having me guys no no problem at all so if you don't mind we'll just plow straight into it so yeah let's talk a bit about your background uh, well, first of all, the always the first question is: Are you a come over? You Manx? Are you Manx Manx? Or are you Manx as the hills? Uh, I, I'm Manx. Um, both my um, parents are Manx. Okay. Um, then when it goes to my grandparents, uh, my grandma's are both Manx. But oh, right. you know, so that's Manx. Yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. give it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll accept you. Thank you. Not no, that. I'm, no, not that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And wherever I go, I'm always Manx. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something I do see. A lot. Obviously, we see a lot out when you're out riding. Uh, and that, that little, the little Manx flag is always part of that. Yeah, it's um, another badge of honour. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, so let's talk about the early days, getting into sport. Where do, where, where do you recall your first sort of interaction with sport and on the Isle of Man? Oh, God, when I was, when I was a kid, you know, it was just running around the, like it, at school, you know, doing right. everything. But, I mean, back to just playing football at school but I mean Matt can probably recall I mean my brother is also a Matthew and yeah. Matthew's brother is a Sam and we grew up at the same time you know we're the same age so Matt's the same age as my brother and Sam's the same age as me and we did a lot of triathlons together yeah, a lot of cycling yeah, yeah. so um, growing up um, I was I did everything I mean I was I was pretty talented I mean I was always at the top end you know but I mean how top end can you say it at that age I mean it was just having fun uh, earliest memories are really sort of those events we used to do, like mm. Tuesday nights down the NSC, uh, those sort of things, which football, school sports, mm. those those sort of stuff. Did you, uh, at that age, were your parents uh, obviously supportive of doing sport, but not pushy, they're just whatever you fancy doing at the time, whether it's be football, netball, whatever. <laughs> <you're>, uh... <laughs> oh yeah, it was just supportive, you know, they, they, they want you to do what you want to do, and it was kind of never really pushy, it was like it had to be from me, and right. I think that's as it always has been, and it's always still now. Um, 
if you don't want to do it, you won't do it. And I always wanted to. And my dad, growing up, he was into his cycling. He's organised cycle races in the Ironman for, I don't know, 20 years, probably a bit longer. Um, he's been involved in cycling. So uh, he was also an age group triathlete uh, for Great Britain. So uh, that's kind of where I got into triathlon side of stuff and, and how uh, into those endurance side of sports. What age did you start doing triathlon? I think it was probably between the age of, I don't know, eight and 14 yeah. almost yeah. about about that age and they would just do a couple of junior ones maybe once twice a year down around the NSC so yeah good fun and obviously that I know you were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 10 yes right? correct uh, obviously that's a big part of the overall story yeah what, at that age at 10 how how did that affect that support that s- sport side of things well, honestly I don't really remember a moment before that like taking sport seriously right. but I mean there was definitely an overlap where I'd done some sport before and then but I wanted to continue afterwards and I always found that I'd never really had a negative story you hear a lot of negative stories about diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and and it, it's a misconception really and that's part of what we do as a team is to try and change those perceptions um, but I don't really remember a time where anyone said I couldn't do something mm-hmm. and even if they did I would that my goal would be that would be my burning desire to prove them that I can and that's probably um, I was always given support and I remember after I'd gone out of the junior level or the young triathlon the maybe eight nine ten years old eleven uh, when I got up to the next level and I started competing in my first senior one at maybe sixteen I still wasn't training for the sport mm. but um, my diabetes care team from the Isle of Man uh, they they helped support me and we worked out a plan to get me to that level and to use it so it was never why can't we do it? I mean, in, in society now, it's so easy to say I can't and and to say no and to be negative. Where it's almost a hard wire, you know? So they were almost like, well, what do we need to do? And then we worked out a solution, a plan, and, and we went from there and uh, pretty successful in my first, in my first race and worked out well. And mm. for those who, who may not know, um, so being diagnosed, diagnosed with that, how did that, how does that change your day-to-day life? How does, how does that impact your exercise routine? In that sense. Okay, so I mean, don't want to pe- teach people to suck yeah, eggs. Yeah, but no, 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 I don't so in, in terms, of, in terms of diabetes, type one diabetes is autoimmune. So okay. there are a lot of misconceptions that uh, it's self-inflicted. Uh, but type one is autoimmune. So my body destroys uh, m- my insulin basically. So my body did no longer produces insulin. I have to manually um, inject my insulin uh, on a daily basis. I mean that, that that's a, a lot of injections or, or through pump. But my, my, my regime uses multiple daily injections. Um, I've got a continuous glucose monitor, a Dexcom, which reads live glucose data. Mm-hmm. So I basically wake up in the morning and make a decision based on what's happened the night before, the oh, day wow. before, uh, what's happened through the night. I make a decision on what ride I've got then. I mean, this is a lot further than it was 18 years ago when I was diagnosed. Um, but now it's a, a daily basis. I make decisions based on what I see. So it, it it's fine tuning and... and for me, when I was diagnosed, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It gave me a mission, and maybe it took a while to realize that, but um, it gave me something to chase, something to show, something to, uh, you know, I mean, I always say it, but it's change your little part of the world. I mean, so uh, my management daily is making decisions based on what I eat, what training I've got, what's to come the next day, what I've done the day before. So there is a lot of influence and factors in it. It's trying to make sure you make the right decision, but um, it, it's just one of those things that I kind of get used to. I probably don't, it sounds a lot for someone else, but because I've done it for so long, mm. it just kind of becomes second nature and yeah, part of, part of like, it's like having a shower, you know, it just, it just happens now. I mean, I, I have to take in, <laughs> take in these factors and, and, and just make a decision based on what, what, what I can see. And I mean, I've got as many tools as possible to, to look at what's going to happen and how it happens, but um so so each, that's yeah. the, when you're 10 11 and yes. is that when you do, you do you initially go to injecting is that the first step yeah so you, yeah usually that's the the, fir- the first sort of way to deal with it to, 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 to manage it yeah i mean mm. so they usually in the in the uk they don't let you leave the hospital until you've learned to inject yourself mm. so yeah. you could be in hospital a long time depending on uh how long it takes you dad's very scared of needles so um <laughs> A lot of it was put on my parents at 10. I can't yeah. really do a lot myself. I mean, if I was diagnosed now, you inf- influence your own diet and everything. So you kind of make those decisions yourself. At that age, my parents had to make a lot more decisions for themselves and for me and, and how we go forward with it. But um, 
they never showed it as anything that was a negative. They took a lot on board that day and, and I'm so grateful for their support. I mean, uh, they've always supported me through sport and through this and, and they've they've got me to where I am now and it's a professional cyclist, so it's not, not been too bad. Yeah. So then, then between 12 and 12 and 15, you're doing a lot of tries, yep. learning how to manage the diabetes as part of that process. Yeah, I mean, going through school was probably the most difficult time because it, I was diagnosed in uh, year six so it was a World Diabetes Day actually so that's how it was in the news I saw mm-hmm. parents saw like Steve Redgrave on TV and uh, that's mm-hmm. put two and two together and I mean the standard uh, symptoms are like increased thirst weight loss and I was shown the exact signs you know so um, mm-hmm. going through secondary school I had to learn pretty quickly on the not only had sort of my school change but a lot of my day-to-day life had changed going from primary school to secondary school so then uh, I just kind of took it on board I mean uh, there's no hiding away from it you have to deal with it it's a situation that okay it's not always easy but it's manageable so um, going through school is not I wouldn't say difficult but you go through a lot as a growing up you know going through teenage years and then getting through that I mean I, I it was probably the easiest thing to manage when you're at that age you know when you're going through everything you want to do everything your friends are doing so I had to make it work you know I had to make mm. it happen if I wanted to continue doing what I wanted to do but honestly I don't really remember it being anything more than just what I had to do I don't yeah. I don't I, it's never been something that I have to deal with it's something that I'll have to deal with what I want to do and then I take it along with me and it's just there it's not something that is in charge I'm in charge and it'll just have to follow me and that's kind of the way I've seen it and that that's really has helped me and at, at school and would would other you know, would, would you get picked on for, would they be looking at you injecting and going, well, you know, you're different? I mean, there was a couple of times, like a scenario in school where um, I was in, in the canteen and then I had to take an injection because I was eating. So I took an injection and the, the deputy head came over to me and said, uh, you can't do that in here because people don't, don't like mm-hmm. it. And I go, well, if I didn't do it, I'd be very sick very quickly and you'd have to then sort a, a, a bigger issue out, you know, and... and I I wasn't disrespectful, but I know what I have to do, and the circumstance and like the the consequences of not doing it yeah. will be a lot harder than some other child not liking it. You know, if you don't like it, you have to look away. Or yeah. I'll never do it in public show. I don't want to do it to put people off. But I mean, it's just something I have to do to stay alive. So I'm, I'm going to do it. And and then from really that day, that must have been maybe when I was twelve, thirteen. Um, it never really became more than that. I mean, even if someone tried to bully me, I would just just brush it off. I mean, it's just something I have to do. Uh, there might have been a few snide remarks, but um, that's not my problem. Yeah. I've mm-hmm. al- I always look at it like um, I can only control what I do and what I want to do. And if someone's got a problem, then it's either jealousy or it's either their sort of misunderstanding. And then that's my time to sort of educate them or, or show them that it's not a problem and this is why I do it. And so I, it was pretty straightforward I mean um, I don't if there was any bullying it's not something that's ever affected me or yeah, something yeah. that I wouldn't be able to handle so no yeah. yeah, reason I ask obviously kids often can be yeah of course we've all gone through that and we can be ruthless for, yeah, I think, for I no think reason when someone's it's looks strange. different or is different or doing something different yeah of course so I, think, I think there was a little bit of that but I mean I guess it's competitive nature and you guys will know I mean as soon as like someone starts creeping in on that on you and trying to like then you then start you get your back up doing his fight or flight kind of thing I'm not looking for a fight you know but uh, mm. it's kind of just one of those things where I've just got to take it on the chin and that's not my problem it's just something that I, just happened but I don't remember any massive yeah, yeah. conflicts or anything that anyone would say anything I don't think they really understood and kept just did it myself you know was there many other at that age many other people that you knew with type 1 so when I was diagnosed in primary school there was no one else Uh, When I went to secondary school, there was no one else. And then maybe two or three years into secondary school, there was another girl in my year who was diagnosed. But beyond that, there was no one else at secondary school at that point. No, not Mm -hmm. that that I remember. But I now now hear a lot more cases now. A a friend, uh, Graham Hatcher's son, Brody, uh, he's one of three in his class. So, I mean, it's a a bigger... um, Obviously, it's more and more cases developing and it's just the way that things go. But uh, Is there a... You mentioned at the beginning there... I butcher it. It's a type. You mentioned the uh, the let's call it the t- type. It's a new new uh, autoimmune. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the word. Yeah. It took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
is there the, is there an incre the increase of them then, or because it's more seen more, is there a an, an external factor to it, or is just like statistically the, the, yeah, that's yeah, just the, the way life is? Sort of thing. I yeah. think it's just statistics. I mean, with type two diabetes, there's a lot more knowledge now. I mean, with type one diabetes, from sort of if you hadn't had it diagnosed, you'd know pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, for the, from probably having the symptoms to to be in to a point where you would need to be in hospital would be a very short time i'm not no doctor so uh <laughs> but it would be probably a month yeah. sort of thing if at most you know because your body's no longer producing insulin whereas yeah. if you type 2 which is a, it's a totally different condition it's it's more maybe lifestyle or that sort of thing you would you would it would take a lot longer to maybe notice that or you might not notice it or it might never be diagnosed yeah. but um the there is a lot more information about diabetes type one and two out there now. So the more that goes out there, the more that it becomes apparent that that might be what you have yeah. got. So if you type two, you might never know, but then now there's more and more cases developing because there's more awareness of it. Mm. Whereas type one, you would know pretty much straight away. So it's kind of like, it doesn't really, it, it's, it wouldn't, wouldn't go undiagnosed. Um, I think you can Google, for, you can Google for a very long anyone, time. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. it's, it's so it's. Uh, I just think it's just one of those things where, as we progress as a human race, you know, more and more are going to develop, and that's just how yeah. it happens. I think I don't know if there's any environmental factors, mm -hmm. uh, genetics. They don't really know. There's not really a uh, an answer yet, yeah. but they're working on it. I mean, I've since had a, my cousin diagnosed, so it could be something genetics, or it could just be freak coincidence. You know, mm -hmm. you never yeah. know. But it's just one of those cards that you dealt. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, so it's quite interesting there you mentioned obviously about it maybe then forming part of your drive up to the even up to well up to this point um, yeah i mean i think again the competitive side i've used it as a benefit i mean it took me a while to realize that it could be something that you can work with but it has given me that reason to to fight and you see people and you see horror stories and it's given me that desire to to say okay let's use it and if you use it as a cycling example if you put me in a another cyclist on a bike we both run out of energy at some point. So um, it gives me a tool to allow my body to know what's happening. So I, I feel that I'm very much in tune with what my body's doing, how my blood sugars are going, so what's happening in my body. Yeah. Whereas you get a lot of people, maybe not sportsmen specific, but a lot of people who aren't finally in tune with their body. And I f you feel that that's just a tool to help me in professional cycling. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to go back then, you, you obviously, I, and I, I remember you uh, in the triathlon, vaguely with my poor memory in the triathlon scene, uh, so you comp competed at a good level at the triathlon scene yeah so I mean to go back to the start I mean I, I was up until 18, 19 I was playing Peel first team goalkeeper I played mm -hmm. for the Alman senior football um, I was really enjoying my football but I was a goalkeeper and I was running like a, a 32 minute 10k so I was like the fittest outfield player but um, I kind of just never really specialised did what I wanted to do and then um, I went to university uh, at 20 uh, and I decided that I wanted to continue that triathlon. I was kind of a bit out of touch with football and mm. it's not really where I wanted to go. And I, I quite like that idea of testing my endurance and getting that bit further. So now I went to university in 2011 and then 20, if I remember. So I started triathlon in 2012 and then within 12 months I was representing Great Britain at um, my first world championships age mm -hmm. group level um, in London. That? So I raced in Hyde Park in, in London the following year, I raced European Championships age group uh, in Geneva and then it kind of barreled from there. And so within sh sh such a short space of time, I was showing that I could build an, an endurance engine. Obviously, I'd had results from running before. I was junior Alaman cross country champion uh, twice. I was uh, Alaman schools cross country champion twice in a row. Uh, so I had an engine. I just hadn't really had anywhere to take it mm. and then so I went to university studying my degree in quantity surveying which is uh, <laughs> uh, taking a turn from what I do now but uh, it then gave me this reason that I, I want to pursue that and then I got to the end of my degree and I was kind of like 2015 the next Commonwealth Games is what 2018 maybe I could I could push on to that but then I got to a, a crossroads really and that's where the cycling journey kind of kind of kicks off from there but uh I, I i'd raced i mean for i did two world championships age group leveling uh so london as i say uh canada 
right. then a European Championships in Geneva. Right. So are they Olympic distance? Uh, so uh, oh, the London was sprint. I think mm. I raced Olympic at the other two. Yeah. So, so that was how did, and how did those come about? Were you racing for your university at that time, so, or was it just like local ones in London? Yeah, kind of it's kind of like enter and yeah, it's kind of like a, a procedure. It's uh, almost there's three qualifying races say and you have to go to one of those races and then finish in top five or, or whatnot it's it's a bit open for interpretation and how they select is is a bit different each race but um i just kind of went through into my university club made a lot of good friends in the club and they kind of showed me where to go and that's how I, I when i started i didn't really know that that was a thing i just wanted to have a routine at university mm. i mean I, I was all for a, a few parties but you know <laughs> Uh, I as I said, I took two years out before I went to university. I'd done that a bit with the football side of stuff, so I was kind of more looking for something to as an outlet. So uh, I was decided that triathlon club was going to be the way to mm. go, and then um, qualified for these races pretty sharp. I just kind of then realised that maybe this is where my sport is, or that that side of stuff is where I'm going to excel a bit more, and really just an outlet from from the work from the university and and that side of stuff. So um, I decided take that leap and, and, and go from there. Was anyone training you at that stage or self? Well, we had a university coach, but right. um, his name's Alan Copeland, still close to him now. He's, the, he's a very good athlete himself. Um, right. But a, apart from that, no, I was kind of just going to the local running club, Gateshead Harriers. So right. um, I was running with very talented people, uh, swimming with talented people and cycling. But at that point, cycling was probably only two hours a week, you know, three hours a week. I wasn't riding a lot. It was... Um, not even my favourite, you know. I mean, I love going for a bike ride, but I was a, a runner. That was where my passion okay. was, really. I was going to ask, of, of, sorry, Matt, of the yeah. three, the running was, did you feel that was your main strength? Yeah, definitely. Stage? I was I was, I was, was a sinker in the pool, so I would definitely <laughs> not be a swimmer ever. Uh, on the bike, I enjoyed it, but it was always more like to build endurance, you know. It would just be a, a nice, easy ride. I didn't really have anything bike-specific, but I really did enjoy it, and I was pretty good. But I, I'd never ridden a race. It was not something right. that I'd really thought about. I loved a good time, Charlie, you know. But uh, like your dad. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it was kind of just like, thought I'd give a, a, the time trials. I did a few tens at that point. But uh, again, I'd done a few tens growing up, you know. I'd done a going back even before I went to university. I'd done a few tens. But then I got called into the Alman senior squad for football and then mm. it was on a Wednesday night so I had to make a decision yeah, about yeah. where I go and I chose football at that point so um, I was doing a few bike stuff that was more dad's influence and I enjoyed it but I wasn't a world beater you know I wasn't it wasn't bad I was doing some decent times but it still hadn't quite piqued my interest yeah yeah okay so the the football and then was the goalkeeping was that again could you be out play, outfield or was it all just keeping You've got two left feet. Or uh, I wouldn't <laughs> say I was bad, but mm. I mean, I'd always been a goalkeeper from, mm. from a kid and I used to love that, you know, that, that shot stopping, the throwing yourself around, maybe a bit like, you know, I don't know, just that, just that fun enjoyment of getting that dirty, you know, just throwing myself about like, being the hero a little bit, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but uh, yeah, just used to love it and I kind of probably wasn't the best as a kid, that's why I got put in gold, maybe. Oh, yeah. It's open to debate. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I kind of progressed from there, really. It was kind of like, you're a goalkeeper, okay, I'm a goalkeeper. So mm. that's kind of how it, how it developed. And, um, played for Peel, did you? Played for Peel, yeah. yeah. So, well, I, I played junior at St. John's, then moved yeah. to Peel and yeah. played senior football at Peel, yeah. Headhunted to Peel as well. Yeah, headhunted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, after the season before, I lost 12 nil to Peel. So, oh, right. uh, <laughs> still they need that, yeah, they need that, they need that goalkeeper. <laughs> but, yeah, it was all right, not so bad. So yeah, I kind of just want to go on that point there. Um, you've been playing goalkeeper way. You're not really moving around a lot. No, no disrespect. Um, <laughs> and you can monitor, it's, I guess, easier to monitor your levels. Then you go all the way to the polar opposite side where you're now exercising and working for a lot longer period of time. So how easy is that to monitor your level? Because presumably when you're doing your triathlons, it, you, you can't just put a needle in or easier to monitor. So I was just wondering how that kind of, how, how you go about on that really. Yeah, I mean like football's like 45 minute and a half, you know, I mean, you can test before, test in the middle and test again at the end. And, and like you say, it's pretty 
docile for want of a better word. I mean, not doing much. I mean, even on the exciting games, I wasn't doing a lot. Um, but um, it's just with triathlon, and, and, and I like to take you to this story. Uh, my last triathlon was in uh, in Bala in um, Wales in twenty fifteen September. Um, I was. Uh, I, I met a guy and I, I was racing with the team over Nordisk brand across my chest and, and um, at this point um, it was kind of like I, I, I was coming towards the end of, of what was my triathlon career and um, a guy asked me like oh I'm type 1 as well how do you how do you cope in a race and I go well I've done all this like sort of I've built up this whole vast amount of experience basically and um, I'm if I test before I know where I'm at in the middle doesn't really matter what's happening as long as I fuel my um, sugars are going to be in the ballpark because I'm exercising um, I've got my morning regime sorted everything's good I've tested throughout the morning I know where where my sugars are going what's happening and as long as I fuel in the middle of the in the middle of the bike then I should end up in in the right ballpark at the end and and for me wanting to win is more important right. and wanting to win is, is just my desire you know it's my competitiveness mm. as, you, as you can all appreciate but um i knew i would be in the right area at the end and, and in that race especially i was and i mean i'd come off the back of but uh, i'd qualified again for the worlds um i'd race it was sub two hours i mean it's it's a fast yeah. a fast race and i'd run a 33 flat 10k so i mean i was i was shifting and i was in the right area and he kind of this guy was like, oh, well, and he then told me his regime and I said, that's perfect. That's what you have to do to monitor your diabetes. And obviously he had it a lot shorter time than I'd had it, but he was not at the point where I was at, where I built up all this information. I said, listen, you just need to, to work on what's good for you, where mm. your influences are and how you, how you need to manage yours. And, and I think he took a lot, a lot out of that. And it was for me, nice to hear someone else's side you know it's not often you meet it's another type one who's massively into sport um and also going back to the original question um i kind of always did a bit more longer distance so whether my body was mm. already ready you know i don't i don't know if that's a thing but it sounds like a thing you know so mm-hmm. uh like when i was a goalkeeper i was also a cross-country runner you know i was doing both and and i guess i'd always done a bit of all that so maybe my body was in a way already ready for that scenario yeah. but I mean it did have to take there was a lot of not wrongs because I don't like to define it as getting something wrong because it's not wrong it's, it's just it's just learning yeah, yeah. so it's, so I like there's a lot of situations that developed to get me to the situation where I'd been in that scenario before so I could I could manage that situation yeah I think uh, that I think because you're obviously monitoring it like you say such a such and you're very conscious about it all the time and in tune with your body yeah. really that uh, it does make that process a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. In inverted commas, because uh, I'd imagine, and whether you come across many people, but uh, I imagine some people don't. They just take their insulin. I don't. I could be wrong, but just take. They need it and they take it, and they they're not perhaps so in tuned. But especially if they're not athletes, that's just day to day life, and they just they just you know my level's getting low. I, I take it rather than. Uh, perhaps managing it a little more, and again, that's not a criticism of people. I just wonder that. that imagine yeah, that I mean, so, anything, yeah. any diseases or anything. Well, like with 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 diabetes, it's so so so. Just a, a quick lesson. I mean, I'm again, I'm not a doctor, but so when you eat, you take insulin because insulin allows the sugar to enter the bloodstream and that sort okay. of stuff. So when you're high, is insulin. So you take your insulin to bring your sugar level down, and okay. then when you go low, you take sugar to increase it. So it's mm-hmm. a fine balancing balancing act, but um. There's people who aren't professional sportsmen. There's people who aren't sportsmen. There's people who are literally going to work and, and doing their thing, and that and that's completely cool. You know, I'm I'm all for anything, but I mean, for me, diabetes and sport is going hand in hand. And I mean, for me to be at the top level, finely tuned, it's just the same as having my diabetes finely tuned. You know, it's kind of one and one. Yeah. But um, some people don't want to be sportsmen. That's completely cool. Um, you do what you need to do and, and, and you build your regime based on what you do. So a regime could be totally different based on going to the office all the time. And well, well, unfortunately, professional cycling is going to have to come to an end at some point, hopefully not for a, a good few years yet. But at that point, then I'll have to manage diabetes again in a different way yeah. based on what is going to happen from that point forward. Yeah. So it is a forever learning curve. Like you're just going to develop as your life develops and mm. it's just things that change. Do you, do you know when you when it's out of sync? Can you 
do you think you can sense it earlier than people that maybe aren't so in tune? You're thinking, I need to, I need to look at this now. Or, yeah, or maybe. Is it the I app? mean, yeah, I believe a lot of it's now controlled. Within, yeah, so within I mean, app. I have an app with the live it's data on, but yeah. I do, yeah. I do get a lot of feeling, you know. So yeah, I mean, yeah. there's hyper awareness. So like you almost feel it coming on like a cloud. You know what I mean? Okay. Like a lot of people can see it from the outside. So I might like lose blood in my face, you know, I might mm. pale up or, or you might know. Oh, it's not like, tan. No, 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 it's just okay. the, ta- the cycling helmet, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but like, I, it would be noticeable and I would notice probably before anyone that my sugars were going low or that are high. And that's where you in, before the continuous monitors, you, you're, you're checking because you're not feeling too good. And then you check and then you know where you are with this answer, with this number, I know where I'm at. And mm. then I can make a, 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 an informed decision based on where the number's at. So like you say, the app is, amazing because you can see where you're at live you have to stop and do anything else to check or whatnot but i mean yeah it's just something i live with now and just quick question on the app um, yeah, yeah. what's that how's that communicating with you know as in like yeah, yeah. You, you look at it, it gives you number but what's what's going on like so as in how... so i wear a sensor on my arm right, yeah. um it, it then it sits under the skin reads uh pulses tells uh mm. converts it and sends it via bluetooth to, to my phone and just uh, <laughs> keeps me up to date it is uh, <laughs> it's the best piece of equipment i've got it's how does that work on the bike so um we have receivers so we have receiver just stick in your jersey you know mm. it's like when you pick out a bar or whatnot you just pick out your oh, okay. receiver and check your check your number and right. in, in a race we'd use the number over the phone but in day-to-day life it's easier to carry a phone than yeah, carry yeah, a phone yeah. and receiver so and does it get, does it warn? Will it warn you then as well? Yeah. So with the Dexcom, it, it will give you an alarm. So if, if you go low and you sleep, it'll set right. it up. And also, it, it's really great because I, I do an initiative on the Isle of Man with with all the parents who have started this campaign to allow uh, access to to children with type right. one diabetes to to monitors. It's called Monitors for Kids. Okay. Uh, the idea is to raise two hundred grand over two years to to allow all under sixteens uh, to have access to to this equipment because it's not provided by the NHS. So um, I've done a few things with the parents and we've done a couple of balls, sold a few jerseys, you know, to try and to try and show that this, it's like a safeguard, you know, you've got parents who, like my parents were, obviously the technology wasn't available, but there's there's parents who, who, who were worried that their child might go low or something might happen. And with, with the Dexcom, uh, it, it pushes through the data, so it will alert you if you go mm. low. This can be then held on like a, a teacher's iPad, you know, in classes sometimes they have it now. It can also be shared to your parents at home. So if you're going low and you're out and about, then your parents will know. So then they can make a, a step or an evaluation based on that. But if you're at school, then the teachers are alert. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of keeps everyone in the loop if you're unable to sort yourself out, you know, if yeah. something's gone too far. But especially for me, the most important is that like at night I can I can see what what's happening and it'll wake me up if, if it needs to. Right, okay, wow. So that that project going on on the island, talk a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, it's called um, Monitors for Kids, as I say. Yeah. Um, we've done two years now. It's coming to the end of the second year, which is is the idea is to have uh, two hundred thousand uh, raised over the two years right. uh, to allow all under sixteens, I believe, uh, to have access to this equipment, mm-hmm. uh, and then hopefully the uh, we're going to lobby the government at the end of it to show that. There's been a lot of change and it's helped and hopefully we can get them to, to take it over and, right. and provide it for everyone, uh, all the all the children. And for me, it's so important because I get it. I have it. I have access mm. to the equipment. So I want everyone to have access. And, and I'm in a very privileged position when a professional cyclist who races for a team, Team Nova Nordisk, everyone's type 1 diabetic. Uh, so I want to use the platform that yeah. I have at, at the moment to, to benefit others. And, and I get a lot of inspiration from from little from the youngsters as well so i mean it's a it's a two-way street they hit like i can help them with this the opportunity that i have and, and that means the world to me you know i mean if if that's all i at the end i i finish professional cycling i know I've just a helped. sec oh hello siri siri <laughs> siri's turned on i don't know what's happening <laughs> new phone and all that um so if i can get i do a lot of like sort of I find the word motivational speaking hot, difficult because I don't feel myself motivational. Um, right. But that's not something that I would label myself with. That's something someone else can label me with. But yeah. I do a lot of talks and you speak to a lot of kids, a lot of adults who have type 1 diabetes, but most of all like parents who whose children have type 1 diabetes. And you realize that you give a lot of comfort from, from what you do. And, and that means the world to me. That's so humbling to know that me just sharing a story and increasing 
a child's like sort of testing level to one more a day, putting a smile on someone's face, is unbelievable. You've positively affected someone's life. So I go to a meet, a meet, and I just talk like like we're talking now, and don't really feel I'm doing anything, but you've you've changed someone's life, and that is so special to know that even if it's a smile, they've come to that, and that that's such a positive outlook that a smile, one more test a day, you've changed someone's life, and that's unbelievable. So, so funny enough, that's all motivation. I think uh, there's often my own view is there's often a uh, not a misconception but motivation isn't always about speaking it's about actions so yeah, obviously yeah. it's your actions that are probably inspiring just as much as much as words that perhaps people don't see and uh, funnily enough again just on a and I, we talked at the beginning there about the introduction I had for the for Inky Johnson and I always try and find uh, something that encapsulates and funnily enough I nearly uh, included uh, a, a speech that I don't know whether, whether the listeners have heard from uh, it's a former former army guy and he was given a, a speech at a college and he talked about changing the world and he was in the army and he just talks about the ripple effect of you just change one person's life or two and they'll change four and they'll change six so it's yeah. just the same 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 philosophy of when you talk about impacting kids uh, and changing their lives and that ability to be able to monitor that it's just that must be for for, for parents let alone the impact it has on the kid the pa- parents who you know obviously must worry endlessly about the children at the best of times, let alone when they're, when they're struggling with this, to have that, that ability and that, that comfort level of that monitor must just be... Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, that's that's what I like. I mean, at, at the age of now, 28, I can sit in, in the camp and be like, help parents knowing that I've been through that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a parent myself, but I mean, then I can relate to the kids because mm. I have the type 1 diabetes. So, like, it, it's great to be able to, a parent to sit down and ask me a question and, and time is something so valuable that I'd love to give as much as I can to people because that's all they want. They want reassurance. Yeah. And it's that ripple effect. I mean, a lot of the time I feel that everything is so global scale or so huge, like changing the world can be something so simple. Okay. It's not having to be, do something that affects 100 like you know, the hundred yep. million people. It, it for me, change your little part of the world, and then they change their part of the world. If you change one person's world, like the ripple effect, you're going to change little parts. And and my world, I try to make as big as possible to help as many people as possible. But even changing that one person, yep. well, then it is the start of changing the world. It's something so minute that then creates a, as you say, a ripple effect. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do at the end of the podcast, if you listen to the out, I'll play the. Uh the speech that I hear and it very much resonates with exactly what you said there. Just one last question on the Manx side of that. You, you mentioned you're working, we are working on the Alman. Who are you working with on the Alman in regard to that project? When you say we. So Monitors for Kids. Yeah. So Monitors for Kids, it's all, it's... Uh, That's the actual foundation. Yeah, so, like so uh, uh, the Manx Diabetic Group is, okay, is, is, is well. right, okay. the, the Manx charity, but it's also, it's run solely by the parents. Okay. So um, although it's connected with the Manx Diabetic Group, it's all sort of, outreach from the from the parents whose kids are gonna benefit from from it so it's all it's very very just it's unsupported essentially yeah. uh, so anything that can be supported in it is, is fantastic because all the work is done by by the parents and the little work i do is showing up at an event and helping out you know putting my face to it is something that i can do to help and try to help i mean we've had, we've had a few a few balls now two balls we did last year and, and this year and they've both been a success so as long as we can continue towards our target and reach our target we're not too far away so mm-hmm. yeah it's looking good good so so then moving on in your career triathlon you're doing triathlons uh talk about that opportunity where the cycling came about you mentioned you obviously earlier you'd had the connection with the team and you they were on your on your jersey and how that evolved then into really i suppose where you're at now in your in your career so in i had this really i was looking on on website and i found this awesome photo of me in world championships in london and it was probably a year after i, I competed and i was like oh, i like that so um I'd seen the team in, in its uh, form in, in some of the races on TV and, and I knew of the team and knew of the team well but at that point I was always in, involved in cycling I, I watched cycling I'd never ridden a race I'd never I'd, but I obviously rode through triathlon um, I just posted a photo of me and just put um, hashtag changing diabetes and racing with diabetes and you know those those sort of uh, those those uh, hashtags and then the team re- reached out to me and said oh you know i mean a couple of the the athletes at the time the elite athletes uh, reached out to me and said you know we, we we're looking for always athletes with type 1 diabetes and at that point um it was 2014 um i reached out to the team we had a, a skype conversation and it was kind of like it went 
went pretty cool. I mean, I was looking just to, to, to connect with them and see what, what, what I could do, if I could be involved. I was a triathlete, so they had an elite team and the triathlete side of stuff is what they brand the elite team as. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I, I could I could join and be a representative in the UK. Uh, they uh, asked me for details, had a Skype conversation. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we'd love it. Uh, maybe a week later, they called me back and said, listen, uh, we've seen your race CV. We want to maybe put you in the development program or at least give you a trial. I was like, at that point, I was going through a lot of situations like, okay, uh, the development team is based in Atlanta, Georgia, in the USA. Um, so I asked the first question was obviously, can I complete my degree? I had one year left. Oh, um, okay. So uh, they were like, well, we'd have to be based in America. So I made a decision at that point that I would accept the triathlete role, but I had to postpone or say no to the, the development role. Um, which if I knew that now, it probably would be a different question, you know, a different answer at least. But um, I then got through that year. Obviously, that's when I raced in Bala with the team kit on. Mm. Uh, and then uh, in sort of 2015, as my degree came to an end, I graduated. Uh, I ran, raced in, in Geneva, the European Championships. I then went to the Island Games in Jersey for the Isle of Man as a triathlete. I was then looking at like, where do I go from here? I want to go to Commonwealth Games. I need to put more time, more resource, but also need money to pay for that. And if I got a job, then I wouldn't be able to train the volume I needed. And it was kind of like, where do I go? I'm up in Newcastle living. My degree is at Northumbria. I'm kind of like in, in two boats, really. I'm kind of like, what do I, I need to do? And, and uh, I was offered a graduate scheme with uh, one of the biggest quantity Spain firms in the UK uh, that I, I was running out of time to accept, <laughs> I, which I did accept based on like looking to take it you know but I, I at this time I was out in Atlanta with the team at one of their talent ID camps which is how they develop into it's like a, a week long where you'll just learn about your diabetes people from all over the world are there uh, kids who want to be on the development team uh, I came along as, as a triathlete elite member I thought I was there to help out really but I mean mm. now I know it's a trial um they they loved it. They enjoyed like I loved the situation, loved the atmosphere, loved what I got from that. And um, then I came back from that, uh, had some good conversations, but wasn't really more aware. Started my first job in the graduate scheme, and then a week later, I was offered a job as a development cyclist, meaning I'd have to to move to America, which was came as quite a surprise really to me, but also to my family because you know my parents have put me through four years of university, and then all of a sudden I'm telling them. Uh, I'm quitting my job after a month and moving out to America to live there. Uh, but nothing but support. I mean, my parents, my my parents, as we discussed earlier, how were they supportive and that sort of stuff? They were, but it's a decision I had to make and it's a decision. Decision. My dad was like, well, this is, but he was more playing devil's advocate than anything else. He wasn't trying to put me off the situation. So I remember emailing the coach, the Daniel Holt, the, the coach of the development team, and he said, um, uh, um, gave me the offer basically and I remember replying to the email after speaking to my dad who hadn't been negative but it was it was kind of more like giving me a balanced view which I'm really really like respect and really uh, like fantastic support you know and I I emailed him back and and co-copied dad in and said listen uh, um, I'd love to take the offer Uh, let's do this and and my dad responded with uh, okay right we're fully on board let's make this happen and that was like the best email I've ever received you know from my dad just to say that we've got your back were there for you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I then had to then go and... I didn't and, say PSUOs for years, uni Yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the, the bit I didn't read. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then, I mean, within a week, I'd handed him a notice. Um, yeah. Two days later, it was... The office was closing for Christmas. I was leaving on Friday. But Dad came over, took all the stuff back on the boat. And, uh, yeah. you know, 1st of January 2016, I started yeah. riding full-time. I've yeah. no experience at all. I uh, raced 10K in October. I was kind of like... Now, now you're a cyclist. First of, as I say, first of January 2016. I've never ridden a bike race. I've never ridden longer than three hours. And now I'm going to be full time athlete. I mean, at this stage, it wasn't professional, but I was uh, full time looking at a training camp in in January. So right. yeah, something to look forward to. And how uh, did, was the thought process of that stage going? What the hell have I got myself into? Or it's here's a challenge. There was here's a, an opportunity. There was a bit of that, but. I want to be a professional cyclist. I want, like, when I went, I was like to my dad, I'm going to be a professional cyclist. Right, like, there was right. no there was no two bones about it. I mean, right. it's, it's a different route into professional cycling, but, I mean, I had the background in endurance sports. I mean, 
if I wasn't a professional cyclist, it wouldn't be for the want to try, you know? So I was like, I've got this one opportunity. There's one place to get professional contract from here. And this is through the team and mm-hmm. to move forward through that. And honestly, it's just, I, again, a competitive edge. I strive to be the best. And, and I took a lot of hits in the first year. You know, I took a lot of learning really fast. I went, my first race, I think was end of April, 2016, after I moved to America. Um, so, that was my first race, I mean, and then my second race, that first race, I think it was called the Blue Goose Race. I can't remember what state it was in, maybe somewhere like, uh, I want to say Kentucky, but it's yeah. it doesn't matter. But, it's, but that was my first race. So we're talking end of April 2016. I then raced a UCI stage race as my second race. I, I mean, do. yeah, yeah. So I raced uh, Joe Martin stage race, first race uphill time trial. Second stage was... Uh, can't remember but i went through a range of emotions i mean there were four stages in total i got to the third and, and dnf and i was like is this what cycling's about but i mean i'm racing a professional road race as my second ever race it's yeah. unbelievable yeah, yeah, yeah. um in terms of perspective i went from racing my first race ever to racing milan san remo in less than two years yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's unbelievable and that's just the desire I have. I want to, I go all in, you know, I'm not messing around. I, I, I moved through the system pretty quickly. And how, how did you find that transition from kind of uprooting yourself in the UK straight over to America and being put in this development? Like, how did you find that pers- personally in that side of it? I mean, I find myself as a massive people person. I love to chat. So I would never have an issue with like sitting by on someone on a plane and just talking about anything. Like, mm. I mean, I love that. But I got to America and I was kind of like, not know, I didn't know mm. anything. Like, I'd always watch Psych and always watch the biggest race, always watch the Tour de France, the monuments, yeah, everything. I knew what Psych was, but honestly, until you ride a bike in a race, you have no, no idea. And I spent the first probably year getting my head kicked in, realizing what am I doing, but gaining experience without realizing you gain experience. I raced. I don't know, probably 80 race days over that first year, but all like local crits, uh, road races in America, traveling through most states racing um, and just enjoying the experience. Still with a desire to, obviously the main goal was to turn professional, but still at this point, although I wanted to do it, didn't know what I needed to do at what stage. Was it not going to be possible? What stage was it going to be possible? When do you pick up those points? But I mean, I raced through that first year picked up a lot of pointers, came to the end of the year and I felt strong, you know, I'd, I'd switched over. I mean, I carried a lot of upper body from triathlon, mm. but I my body was adapting. Um, I was still very far behind on skills, like skills you learn as a four, five, six-year-old that I, I had because I'd done a bit of cycling around like with Dot and, and those stuff, but I was never a world beater, never going to like, I was always in the top five, six, but never really like super, super out um, like at the top, but always there or thereabouts. So, um, just learned that first year was such a learning curve. I don't think I've learned more than in that first six months as a cyclist. We we I know we were chatting recently about about that, and I I still find it. I think it gets a little lost, or easily lost because I, I cycle from a young age, and the skills are just riding in bunches, mm-hmm. uh, knowing what's going on in the race. I kind of not that I know a lot, but it's, a lot of it's inbuilt, and I see lads around my age now getting into the sport. And trying to adapt, I appreciate I'm a bit old, but trying to adapt and learn these things, and they're ingrained in me. So suddenly, to, for you to go into a sport where you've done some racing, but time trial, and for those that don't know, is a lot different from road racing. Yeah. You throw people into a road race, it's there's just an unbelievable amount of thing. And I imagine you still learn to this day, as as everyone learns. But that learning curve, you're no respect, you're so far behind it when you step on on the yeah, I mean, first bike racing skills. Two years, two years before doing the Milan Sunday, yeah. which, <laughs> it's, which for those that don't know. Is, one of the biggest one-day races, well, probably is the biggest one-day race in the world that that Cav Cav won a number of years ago. 2009, I think. Yeah, Yeah. and uh, 260k. 300. 300k. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Neutralised and cleared. 293, I believe, without neutral. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to step into into that arena uh, and and learn, and I have to learn that at such a, and learning it in such a, I suppose a stressful environment as well because again r- racing you're not you know you're not in that environment you're not relaxed because you're in something that's new to you as well yeah, so yeah. you're trying to pick all this up while getting your head kicked in uh, and, and trying to take stuff trying to take stuff out of it trying to stay motivated trying to 
trying to believe it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, when you say it like that, it sounds like a lot, but I mean, you take it so simple when, when you do it, you know, and, and I'm still learning every day in, in, in the group and I, I get better. Um, the stuff I see people do, which is unbelievable, like you like, like racing like Cav Pizza Gun who can do everything on a bike, you know, and it's unbelievable that you see these guys, but these are all one in a million people, you know, and um, racing at the top level is special. Um, and... I, I I do find myself on the outside of the pelt on early, in early stages I was kind of like overriding using what came naturally and that was to push hard mm-hmm. so a lot of the time it almost felt like I was doing a solo time trial on the side of the bunch and that, that would take that with a pinch of salt but it felt like my default was to just ride as hard as I could for as long as I could which has probably helped me a, long, a lot more than anything else has but now I know how to finesse a little bit more and get into the bunch and, and work out. And you have to, it takes a long time to work out how a bunch moves and, and how it how it adapts. It's almost like a cyclical motion, I want for a better phrase, I mean, it's cycling, but it's like a washing machine effect and you're just rotating, constantly rotating. And if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. So you've got to kind of like adapt and realize what's going on. And, and then you, I've watched, like I say, cycling my whole life and you don't really understand what's happening in there until it happens. And you, you're touching people at, 70k an hour sometimes and it's unbelievably close and yeah. and you're going through all this you got to it's a lot more physical contact than people actually realize yeah, and yeah. and if you can watch some some shots from inside the peloton it's quite interesting actually but yeah and the bike um, cams yeah the bike yeah, cams yeah, it's yeah. changed like the way you can view the sport but it's it's a lot of respect you have to you have to know what's going to happen know what your situation is like i'm not a sprinter so uh, it's not very rarely that i'm at the front with 100 meters to go um and that's not my place um but uh I do what I can and I mean I'm learning and adapting I mean over these I've just finished my second year as professional cyclist and it's only my third or nearly come to the end of four years uh, as a cyclist so it's unbelievable when I look back what's happened what I've done how I've evolved in such a short space of time that I can only take that forward and it gives me more desire to see what another year will give yeah. me I suppose that comes back to again the motivation people see in, in what you're doing there and you know showing that with type 1 diabetes that you can achieve many many things and yeah, yeah. very rapidly as well i mean i i work with a, a, um, a local a local guy called phil quirk he does a lot of mind yeah. based stuff and it's really good because he gave me this uh, scenario and it's based on motivation is so fluctuating you know it's like anything but commitment is the one thing that keeps you going so in the morning my commitment is to type 1 diabetes and to change my world and to ride my bike and to do all that together is one so i'm committed to that whereas motivation comes and goes a little bit um, it does fluctuate uh, I feel that my motivation and commitment are the same level so I feel pretty motivated mo- most days because I'm doing what I love that I would do as a hobby but I'm doing it as a job so it, yeah, it's yeah. like I still have to pinch myself sometimes but like that commitment is that I, I, I doesn't waver you know it's yeah. it's there so so 08 you go you've been racing in the States 07 08 would you consider that um, I appreciate you're full time but I'm full time pro cyclist that's when it it really kicked in. So when when I joined the the professional team, yeah. I stagiaired, which is a trainee role in twenty seventeen. Yeah, yeah, so mid twenty seventeen, I'd come back here. The nationals were on the Isle of Man. Um, mm-hmm. I was not telling anyone. I'd been asked to go to this pro team. I was waiting really, but uh, I raced nationals here, time trial road race, and then uh, my first professional race was going to be back in the states. So I raced Tour of Utah as my first professional race there. But I guess not fully professional, but first professional races, Stagiaire and Tour Utah, Colorado Classic, you know, so it's two big races and I, I survived, like more than survived, you know, I held my own and uh, I felt pretty good at that stage. I kind of like, had didn't have a confirmed contract, but you know, like as people in the past who Stagiaire tend to be good enough for the pro team, so that's where they put them on. But I want to show that, I want to prove that. I don't want to go off what's happened to other people. I go off and make my own sort of way. So uh Raced really well, did really well, uh, offered a professional contract after that and then raced again in China twice after after that and mm. then that was the finish of my second season. So that was at the end of 18? T- end of 17. 17, yeah, sorry, yeah. right, okay. So then, yeah, so 18, Milan San Remo. Yeah. Obviously a big uh, big badge of honour to ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was Huge. that? When did you get told about that? So I went into my first training camp with the professional team. It was sort of at the end of... The end of se- end of seventeen, yeah. So coming into eighteen, um, 
need to really establish myself. You know, I'm I'm not looking for a free ride. I'm not here for a free ride. I'm here to to ruffle some feathers and and to push on and do what's good for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, be a team player, but uh, I'm need to learn, want to learn, willing to do everything. Looked at the race schedule, race schedule looking good, but mine was probably a bit lacking in some of the days that I I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was probably not racing till April, which mi- missed out on the early early stages. Dug in deep, um, had a good winter training camp. Then we went out in January back to to where we're based in Calpe in in, uh, in in January and and was pushing on really well, you know. And uh, then I was um, given the chance to to race it the uh, what was the Abu Dhabi uh, race is now UAE. Uh, but I so I, I was then given my first race as World Tour. So we've come forward from April to, to February, uh, and then I get in the breakaway in in my first ever World Tour race, my first ever professional race. Uh, so I had so much confidence, you know. And then uh, we're coming into March, and then I wasn't really again on the roster much. Uh, one of the guys pulled out from Larciano, which is uh, like our building race to Milan San Remo. Um, I went there, uh, DNF'd with probably. I don't know three quarters of the field wet horrible day miserable just climbing you know I did did all right now I was, suffered through got through most of the race but just uh, it was lapped so they just pulled most of the race so only like it's, it happens uh, and then uh, on my way home uh, I get this email says Sam uh, boss says Sam you come to Milan San Remo so I mean I was straight on the phone to my parents saying I was just being uh, told I'm going to Milan San Remo I'm like oh my god like don't don't really know what's going on don't really know if it's someone pulling my leg but. And uh, next week I'm flying out to uh, Milan to, to race uh, a monument. You know, yeah, it's my yeah, third yeah. race as a professional athlete, and uh, I'm racing Milan San Remo. That's nuts. Yeah, that is yeah, absolutely yeah. crazy. And what was that experience like? Absolutely unbelievable. It was the worst day. Imagine the Isle of Man in the winter. It's <laughs> like pouring down with rain. Uh, we're on the... It snowed up on the hills. No, that was that. I think that was a few years before, before but. Uh, it was pouring down, and, and and those who aren't familiar with Milan San Remo, it's it, as we said before, it's three hundred kilometers, including neutralized. Uh, but the first seven eight k, which is neutralized out of out of Milan San Remo, uh, out of Milan, sorry, is almost like being on Douglas Prom with the trap with the tram tracks, but in every direction. So it's wet, it's cobbles, it's slippy. There's four or five crashes, and I'm like, not panicking, but I'm kind of like yeah, yeah. realizing the situation I'm in. I'm racing racing Milan San Remo in my first season as a pro, in my second month as a professional cyclist, in my third race as a professional, and I'm pinching myself. I, it, I'm, I could have been on a beach in the Bahamas, you know, I was... Quantity surveillance yeah. there in, in, in <laughs> exactly. Halifax. I was ready for this. Yeah, I, right. It's like, it. no matter what that day threw at me, I was, I was going to give absolutely everything. And um, yeah, so uh, that was kind of... It was just unbelievable. It was a. Tell me, cramped towards the end. Oh, no, I mean, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was just a very long day. Yeah, it was. I, uh, I think I, I forget how long that day was, but it was a bit slow, you know. Um, oh, so like we seven, was hour, like, seven hour race. Yeah, it was eight, eight, eight hour race, yeah, I think, yeah. or closer to the eight, and uh, yeah. it was. Um, it's you go through a range of emotions, you know. It's actually not the distance. I mean, it's just. It doesn't feel very long. I've been in races that are 160k that feel longer, yeah. um, but the problem is it's relatively. It builds like a like a, a crescendo. You know, you go through the Tokino Pass, but that's um, a, a climb in the middle, and then you come onto this onto the coast and up towards uh, the French border, and uh, you kind of like realize what you're in, and then at the end they got the Tre Capi, which is the three peaks. I I think it translates roughly to, but. Um, then that's where the race kicks off. So you've raced 240k, 250k, and this is where the race is going to kick off. And then that's just where it becomes an absolute yeah, like yeah. a slinging match, you yeah. know. And and I got through. I mean, yeah. I remember it, it well, and it still now brings like you a lot of emotion back. You know, you folks down there when you they were there for the second the, the year after that oh, uh, they okay. came to to watch the next then. time. Yeah, so that that is one of my biggest memories as a professional athlete is having your parents at the finish of Milan San Remo. It's unbelievable, you know. Um, they don't often say they're proud. Well, my mum would, my dad, you know, he's like face of stone, but uh, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, no, you could see it on his face that he realised what was actually happening. On, you know, yeah, and what yeah. they realised that. They, they talk about it, but those types of races, like yeah, the yeah. opera of just that build. And yeah, build yeah, and yeah build exactly. To, That's to, to a finale. To a T, yeah. yeah. When you're in it, it's, it feels a lot the music more. Around, yeah, 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 the music just, yeah, yeah. it builds, it, it just all of a sudden kicks off and that's, 
Yeah, it just. And how do you find fueling again? Obviously, a lot different going into the, into long endurance cycling. F- fueling wise, is that obviously another thing? Like I think again, I think people perhaps don't realise is educating yourself around. Yeah. So do you mean in we, terms like diabetes well, or both, in everything? Both. Well, yeah. I mean, the I, thing I, is, I know if I had to do it, I've got diabetes and I rocked up. But it, I, my head would explode thinking about just have to fuel myself. <laughs> I haven't got tag on time. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, for me, like, fueling is unbelievable. I absolutely love food, and that's probably why I enjoy being a professional cyclist. (laughs) But, uh, like, if you put me and A, another cyclist on a bike, you know what I mean? Like, for the people listening, someone like Chris Froome, just say anybody. Um, If we both sit on the bike, we're both going to need to fuel at some point. I use diabetes as as a regime to allow me to know how my body is, as we've discussed as well. So, so for me, it's just just fuel, just continually fuel. You know, if I'm doing the right things in terms of continuously fuel, my, my diabetes tends to line up, and that's mm-hmm. just the way it is. If it's good in the morning, if it's good, I've got everything lined up. There's no less peaks. You keep it a flat line as best as possible. Uh, it's not always perfect, but... Um, you Does it just, play on your mind when you're racing? Yeah, a little bit, you know, especially if you come out of your target area, you know, if you come mm-hmm. out, if you're going a little bit higher, a little bit lower, then it starts to become more you know once you've started got a grain of sand it builds and builds and builds when it when it's like that then it's a bit difficult but when it's doing exactly what you want it to do then yeah. it becomes it's not a problem and it's not a problem anyway but when it's in target you feel a lot better you're just eating you're constantly eating yeah. i mean it's when you're doing like milan san remo but also less races you just need to keep feeling throughout the day especially when milan san remo is a one-day race but if you've got a seven-day race you are feeling for the next day you're feeling for the next three days or whatever so constantly fueling making sure everything's right and it's just another way to to check and it's just use it as another tool like fitness it just use my my dexcom my blood le- sugar level as a as mm. another instrument to allow like heart rate you know if your heart's like you know if you if you've got a cold or something your heart rate might be a bit higher a bit lower and then it's i just use it similar to that it's just another tool to allow me to it's, it's interesting actually because part of the things we want to talk with other people about as well is, is the mind on, on and psychology in racing so it must be so because sport at any level, everyone has their battles internally in their head, whether they haven't got any form, whether their legs aren't feeling right. And it, have I fueled enough? And just to add another layer of that is, is my insulin at the, where it should be. It's just another thing that can chip mm-hmm. away at that that motivation and not motivation, but that, that mindset. That, yeah, I mean, I like to think I'm pretty stern, you know, pretty like stubborn, foc- <laughs> stubborn, stubborn <laughs> focused. Uh, you know, I don't like to, I like to, be in control of what yeah, I can yeah. be in control of. And if it's outside of my control, it's out of my business, you know? It's mm-hmm. like, if I can't control it, then yeah, yeah. it's nothing to do with me. Yeah. If, like, it's, like, some people's opinions, all that sort of stuff, I mean, if... Yeah, sorry. So you talk about that. You see, you see, I see that more and more, the, and I know uh, Sky and uh, uh, British Cycling. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. okay. It's okay. Uh, and the other, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, they talk about just controlling what you can control. And yes. Is that something you've learned yourself or, again, within that team environment, is that something they educate you on as well? I mean, like, when you're in a team environment, you do pick up things from other people, but I, as I said before, I've worked worked closely with a, a couple of people from over here. Uh, Phil Quirk yeah, is one yeah, of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I work with him, and, and, and he taught me this scenario. It's almost like if you imagine a circle is your control. If If there's something that's bugging you, but it's outside of your control can you bring it into your control can you influence it if you can influence it you have to ask a question that question would then give you the is it in your control do you bring it into your control or do you just say it's now not in my control and push it away so um you either take ownership and make something within your circle of control or you just pass it off so Mm -hmm. so maybe if you don't ask the question it would just chip 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 whereas if you ask the question and the answer is oh, no, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, it's not my problem. But if it then go, oh, well, you could do this, then it becomes your problem. You sort it out, and then that's just the way I look at it, and that's the way it works for me. And and there are things, if you allow stress to build up and things, different things to, to bother you, it can be a big burden, you know. You mm-hmm. A lot of things, as soon as one thing starts happening, then it incurs more, you know. It kind of becomes then a heavier, heavier, heavier. Whereas I try to... to not allow that to happen and sometimes with the diabetes side of stuff sometimes it can be like today it's just not working for me but if you realize that it's one day it's not a month of two months a year of bad yeah. whatever um then you just, it's a lot better you know so if my control might something might have happened i might have traveled long haul or come home and my diabetes just isn't playing ball i just make sure that 
you're doing the right yeah. things. Trust the process, as they say. You know, if you're doing what you know is right and you're not getting the right answer, it doesn't mean what you're doing is wrong. Yeah. It just means that something is else is affecting it that that happens. So if I know I'm doing the right training and not feeling great, I will feel better when it all clicks. You know, I mean. You just need to have those questions with your coach, with your management, with the team, with your friend, you know, anyone who can support you. So, yeah, so I've, uh, I went on a, on a short seminar, Phil's, a little while ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, really good. And I know he certainly had recommended people look him, looking him up. I know he's on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I know people have been on his courses and I'm first just on a self-improvement level yes. is, you know, it's good, let alone in sport. Uh, so yeah, certainly as a, as a local guy who's, <coughs> works around the globe now and um, work with top athletes but it's not really about even athletes is it? it's just, no, just mind, everything yeah, yeah yeah so def- definitely have a look up for phil quirk uh, so then over the last 18 months then how's that how's the cycling developed how's that endurance how's the well i mean how's it all going it's crazy as we've just discussed the whole sort of scenario that i'm in but um Okay, my route to professional cycling was completely different to everybody else's, but I come with a background that is a good background, yeah, you know, yeah, a good sure. a good endurance base, a good a good a good background, and, and I'm competing at the top level. I'm not like mm. out the back. I'm not like out of the way, you know, not not finishing. I'm in the breakaway in world tour races. I'm holding my own. I'm doing um, what I can when I can, and, and this year. Um, I supported uh, Charles Planet, a, a teammate of mine. He won uh, the intermediate sprint jersey in Tour Poland, which is World Tour. So our first World Tour jersey, mm-hmm. I was involved in that. Um, going back a little bit before that, I mean, my first year as a professional, I think I raced four World Tour races. Um, I raced Commonwealth Games for the Isle of Man in the Gold Coast. Um, I did a lot, yeah. you know. When I, when I think about two years in professional cycle, I've raced two Milan San Remos, Commonwealth Games. I think in total, I've raced five world tour races this year including like tour of california tour of poland milan, milan san remo uae tour so there's there's a lot of world tour and big races that i'm racing and i feel the progression is being steady and upwards you know and I'm, I'm, I'm everyone says there'll be a plateau but for me I, i'm a 15 16 17 year old kid who's just started the sport so why mm. does that have to to change now i mean i i've not been in the sport long okay i might be a bit older but why does that mean that I'm past that rate of, mm. rate of progression. You know, I'm gonna hopefully continue that rate of progression and push on. And I want. I, I'm not gonna lie. I want to win races. Um, we don't get on the podium as much as we'd like to, as much as we probably deserve to. But I mean, cycling is a lot of luck as well. Mm. Um, I wore my first uh, jersey uh, in the K- uh, KOM uh, competition in King of the Mountains. Yeah, King, King of the Mountains. Yeah. Sorry for yeah. the average yeah, non cyclist. Um. So in race tour of California, came back to straight to tour of Estonia. Um, didn't have a great first day. It was a, a technical time trial, and obviously we discussed my technical ability. It's not very good. So uh, the next day, pouring down rain, typical Manx day. I loved it. Uh, so right, I'm going in the breakaway. Out. Yeah, got in the breakaway. Um, picked up second place in the second KOM, and I didn't even realise it was a KOM like. It, it thought it was flat but they, they were awarding the last two sprints of the day with a KOM and, and one guy uh, out, sprint, out sprinted me I was coming back on him you know and I can't, took second but really should have taken first and, and that's just maybe a bit of naive or just like unaware I just wasn't quite sure where the line was it wasn't quite at the top of the hill yeah so uh, came second I was like well you know what? I can I can take a jersey here. I can if I if I if I'm first in the next one, he's not second. So um, I waited for the group to get within twenty seconds, and there's still maybe forty k. So I knew they weren't ready to catch us. And when the group was in twenty seconds, I just took off. You know, I went back to time trial and and full mm. gas eight uh, k solo. Uh, took the took the um, the first points. points from that, and then uh, wore the jersey into the second day. And uh, it was just a bit of miscommunication. The next day meant that I lost. The jersey based on overall GC, which is oh, a bit frustrating, yeah. but it's it's a learning curve and it's something that people may not realise. But a lot of teamwork goes in, into cycling, and we had two guys in the top ten overall, uh, me just outside. So we had a lot of lot to uh, juggle. a lot of to, lot to really juggle, and and that risk we put on mainly to try and finish more in stage position mm. uh, and uh, then the GC position as well. So I mean, I lost the jersey based on I had equal points, but lost it on. Mm-hmm. Um, overall but I mean those things happen and I'm hoping that I'll get that opportunity at some point later down the line uh, but I'm 
just happy with the season, you know. I mean, mm. I couldn't say it's it's pretty much been a perfect season. I, I finished in um, the Tour of Tai Lake 2.1 in China. Um, so again, 2.1 is the grade. Uh, okay, yeah, overall. right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a, it's pretty high. It's yeah, yeah. high middle rank race in, in it's, uh, a good race. Um, yeah. Some good European teams uh, went up there, um, Finished twentieth in the time trial in the prologue, which again for those people, it's a, a, a small time trial to start the race. Uh, you don't ever jump off the time trial. No, I need no, to go for ten k one now. Like, yeah, <laughs> maybe. You yeah, know, uh, days I, think in. I went for a run once in off season and, oh. and never again. Yeah, right. so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I want to do what I used to do, and it's just not possible. Um, mm. So yeah, so I went to to Tour Tai Lake and and um, managed to get myself in the breakaway in the second to last stage. It's seven or eight stages, I forget. Um, but uh, anyway, come away with top 20, 16th overall, uh, mm-hmm. less than a second from top 15, less than two seconds, I believe, from the top 12. So um, I might be slightly wrong on that, but you get the picture anyway. So more UCI points and more ra- a better ranking. Uh, so if you thought, like if I was told two years ago, I would finish top 16 in a, in a highly classified UCI race, mm-hmm. I would be over the moon mm-hmm. to have done that to race you know twice a monument yeah. uh, to race Commonwealth Games for my the Isle of Man you know the biggest w- way we can represent our island yeah. uh, I'd take you I'd more than snatch your hand off you know so I think uh, I, I've been trying to think of kind of uh, sort of examples of comparing that how quick that movement is from because you think then you know if you're a good athlete a runner today and in two years you're representing GB in the you know in a marathon in the Olympics for example it's not even a comparison because I don't think anyway because I don't think and there's no disrespect to runners it's not super technical to go running you know you run as hard as you can but so if you compare yourself to you know, just an example where it might be an F1 drive and go one day you're doing diving around fast and then two years later you're in a F1 there's so much more going on yeah, yeah, yeah. outside of your own skill ability and, and fitness there's then all these other factors which I just uh, unless you've you know I've raced a bike and it's stressful enough racing around the local roads with what's going on <laughs> yeah. then throw yourself in with a load of professionals who've got 15 years in their legs and all that knowledge and information uh, I just yeah I can't speak highly of how hard that must be and they're probably unnoticed by so so many people yeah I mean well thank you first of all <laughs> I mean yeah but it, it's difficult but I'm not looking for praise you know I'm not no, looking no. and 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 that's not but, that's not yeah <laughs> it's not about praise it's, it's more about just yeah, that appreciation yeah of course but I mean is I'm not in the of it. I don't it doesn't influence me if people don't really understand you no. know but I mean yeah it is it's a big step and and uh i don't do it because i want other people to think oh wow but i mean it is wow yeah, you know yeah, to me yeah, i'm yeah. like wow right. every every day you know <laughs> it's like and I, i'm happy with that you know if, if if i make no one other than myself proud then great but yeah. i mean i feel that i've done such a sh- a lot in such a short amount of time that that gives me so much positivity to see what more i could do in another year mm-hmm. and that's what i want to do i want to win bike races so uh, yeah, to basically watch this space. That's where I want to go with it. I want to continue to push, continue to to change my small part of the world, and go go forward with it all. The uh, the the team itself, obviously, through this whole process, super supportive. You're obviously a, a spokesperson for Type One. That's all part of your role as well. You yeah, yeah. That is, I talking do, around yeah. the world on that subject. Yeah, I mean, I've done uh, a, a European. Uh, a year, it's a, a European Diabetes Association uh, sort of a talk there at their their uh, annual meeting I did in in Stockholm in twenty fifteen. Uh, I get to go to different ones in the UK. Get to talk to to local. I mean, I was at a, a ball a few weeks ago. I mean, always a ball that sounds like I, I, I just wear a dinner <laughs> suit, you know. But um, I went to one and we raised ten thousand pounds for JDRF, which is a juvenile diabetes research mm. foundation in the UK. Uh, so I mean, I get to go to these places and and change people's ideas idea of diabetes now we're all grown up in this society where diabetes is our fault or something happens and it's just misinterpretations probably facts that maybe cross over with type 2 diabetes that are then linked to type 1 and people don't really understand so i not only help change the idea of people with type 1 and help them but my idea and my goal and with the team to inspire educate and empower everyone around the world affected by diabetes it's to show that what it actually is kind of trying to define that yeah, yeah. diabetes 
isn't stopping us, isn't slowing us down. We're at the top level of professional cycling, but there's more out there than just riding a bike. You know, we just, I just want to change someone's life who thinks that diabetes is all this mountain to climb, mm-hmm. whereas take the rough with the smooth and, and kind of make it just that little bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you just, you pretty much saying there, um, traveling the world, doing all different events and your races. How have you found that going from like, as soon as you've gone across the base in Atlanta and, is that your Atlanta, sorry? Atlanta, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you went across there. Now you're pretty much well. Do you live out of suitcase? Like, what do you? What's your kind of schedule like? Are you all business class? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no business um, class. No. Is that where you're? You know, in and out of suitcase all the time. Would you get much downtime to come home? You know, back here. Yeah. So when I was on the development team, it's purely based in America. Uh, you unpack. You have your room. You know, you have. We're based in a in a, in a house in America. That's really so they can keep an eye on the team. They can race the team together. They can see where they're at and if they're good enough to move up to the professional team. When I turned professional, I was based in Europe. So I'm based on the Isle of Man. People are always asking, "When are you home? You're home. I'm, I live here." But <laughs> the issue is, bike racing tends to happen on the weekend, and most of the time, people want to know where you are is on a weekend. You know, so mm. um, I'm here most of the time. Training here most of the time I'm away maybe a few times a year on training camp but I do I um, spend a lot of time away but more at races so I'd probably say 50% of my time here and there I think I've been haven't properly unpacked the suitcase probably since I started yeah. um, it is a lot of living out of suitcases I mean when you go to a bike race that's seven days long you're in a new hotel every yeah. night on the on on sort of most of the time uh, so it is a lot of living out of a suitcase that sort of stuff and you do kind of get used to it I'm not saying it's easy yeah. And people probably think professional cycling and professional sport is glamorous. It's not as glamorous as you think. Mm. Uh, but I don't do it because I want the glamour. Yeah, I do yeah, it because yeah. I bloody enjoy it. Yeah, and yeah. I really want to continue to do that. Yeah. So the traveling can be difficult when you fly to China within 48 hours you're racing. Uh, you've just shifted forward nine time zones and your body's all over the place. Mm. But it's just the same for everyone, you know. So um, it happens, you get something to to learn and, and, and go from there. I'm sure you'd adapt quicker if they flew your business class. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing, but yeah, 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 yeah. sometimes the budget didn't stretch. Yeah, 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 that'd be nice, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it, imagine? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're now at the end of 2019. Uh, so 2020, year ahead. What's the plan for Mr. Brand? So, uh, yeah, I'm signing a new contract for 2020. So that, that that's great news. Same team. So uh, looking forward to, to pushing the message. Um, uh, I've had a lot of support from Alman Sport this year, so that that's been great. I mean, um, their 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 help is is pushed me on, um, so I'm grateful for that. And going forward as well, um, I'm looking to be on the podium. You know, I'm I'm not in cycling to make up a number. I don't want to be. I want to be out in front. So, you know, uh, world tour races on the podium again. Maybe at the world tour level, that's asking for a lot. But any any race on the podium, uh, I just want to. I want to be involved. I want to. Uh, you know, make a name for myself, show people that I'm not here to just, as I say, make up the numbers. So uh, uh, watch your space. I'm going to push on and uh, hopefully bigger things to come. And if people want to reach out to you, uh, whether it's diabetic related or not, how, yeah. do, how do they do that when well, they find you in the social media world? Yeah, so I try to make myself as accessible as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd really like to, if someone has a question or anything, I'm pretty, pretty good at responding. Um, uh, Instagram at Samuel Neil Brand. Uh, mm-hmm. On uh, Twitter, I'm at Sam. Uh, N brand uh, and then my uh, website I write a blog uh, probably not update as much as uh, I'd like to but at the moment it's uh, I've got one in the works so that's uh, www.samuelbrand.com so uh, you can reach me there there's a contact form come straight to me so uh, mm-hmm. if anyone wants to reach out then yeah feel free and please do so and I know uh, I think it was maybe 18 months ago I mean obviously knew you anyway but reached out because my sisters had a friend who had diabetes and they were just looking for a chat and you immediately yes let's set something up let's have a chat so i'd sort of certainly implore people whether it's necessarily diabetic related or not do reach out because uh you've got an opportunity to get some feed, you know mm. feedback help advice yeah, yeah, commentary whatever that might just provide a bit of help in, in day-to-day life yeah, yeah some, which, sometimes just that year to listen you know yeah, sometimes yeah. that's unbelievable and i know i would i would appreciate that from from other people so it's nice to be able to offer that back so yeah anyone feel free reach out and uh, you know where to find great so thanks for your time. No, thank yeah, you very much, guys. Yeah, thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it, really good. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, so yeah, no, no, enjoy your training camp off <laughs> to the sunny climbs. And the oh, yeah, I know. Apparently 18 degrees, so yeah, no, no, no. about 4, 5 to 18, yeah. I'll Heart take bleeds. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't care anymore. <laughs> All right, thanks again. Thank so, you very much. Thank you.
So Matt, if you much much to add? Yeah, um, just on our side of it. Um, if you want to like, share, and subscribe this, please, on your podcast outlet, so Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever you're listening, listening to it right now. Um, you can also find us on the Facebook, which we the have the handle. I know, the Facebook, it's yeah, like I know, dad. yeah. <laughs> um, under the handle of the M Word Podcast. Uh, we also have a Twitter, and that's at Manx Sport Pod. Uh, like to hear from as many people as possible. Um, if you've got a story, we want to hear it. Um, we're always up for a chat. And yep. yeah. Manx Focus. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. Word out from Martin. And word out from Matt. Just before we disappear from your ears, following on from the conversation earlier about the ripple effect, we'll play in full now the University of Texas commencement speech from 2014 by Admiral William H. McRaven, which talks about the ripple effect and how you can affect people's lives. Enjoy listening. So the university's slogan is, what starts here changes the world. Well, I've got to admit, I kind of like it. What starts here changes the world. Tonight, there are almost 8,000 students, or there are more than 8,000 students, graduated from UT. So that great paragon of analytical rigor, ask.com, says that the average American will meet 10,000 people in their lifetime. 10,000 people, that's a lot of folks. But if every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people, and each one of those people changed the lives of another 10 people, and another 10, then in five generations, 125 years, the class of 2014 will have changed the lives of 800 million people. 800 million people. Think about it. Over twice the population of the United States. Go one more generation, and you can change the entire population of the world. Eight billion people. If you think it's hard to change the lives of 10 people, change their lives forever, you're wrong. I saw it happen every day in Iraq and Afghanistan. A young army officer makes a decision to go left instead of right down a road in Baghdad, and the 10 soldiers with him are saved from a close-in ambush. In Kandahar province, Afghanistan, a non-commissioned officer from the female engagement team senses that something isn't right and directs the infantry platoon away from a 500-pound IED, saving the lives of a dozen soldiers. But if you think about it, not only were those soldiers saved by the decisions of one person, but their children were saved, and their children's children. Generations were saved by one decision, one person. But changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do it. So what starts here can indeed change the world. But the question is, what will the world look like after you change it? Well, I'm confident that it will look much, much better. But if you'll humor this old sailor for just a moment, I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation, or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and, and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, 
and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. <laughs> during SEAL training, the students, during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing the uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as a sugar cookie. <laughs> you stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never going to succeed. You were never going to have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, 
get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list, and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, everyone, everyone made the circus list. But an interesting, an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did two hours of extra calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circuses built inner strength and physical resiliency. Life is filled with circuses. You will fail. You will likely fail often. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At times, it will test you to your very core. But if you, don't, if you want to change the world, don't be afraid of the circuses. At least twice a week, the trainees were required to run the obstacle course. The obstacle course contained 25 obstacles, including a 10-foot wall, a 30-foot cargo net, a barbed wire crawl, to name a few. But the most challenging obstacle was the slide for life. It had a three-level, 30-foot tower at one end and a one-level tower at the other. In between was a 200-foot-long rope. You had to climb the three-tiered tower, and once at the top, you grabbed the rope, swung underneath the rope, and pulled yourself hand over hand until you got to the other end. The record for the obstacle course had stood for years when my class began in 1977. The record seemed unbeatable until one day a student decided to go down the slide for life head first. Instead of swinging his body underneath the rope and inching his way down, he bravely mounted the top of the rope and thrust himself forward. It was a dangerous move, seemingly foolish and fraught with risk. Failure could mean injury and being dropped from the course. Without hesitation, the student slid down the rope perilously fast. Instead of several minutes, it only took him half that time. And by the end of the course, he had broken the record. If you want to change the world, sometimes you have to slide down the obstacles head first. During the land warfare phase of training, the students are flown out to San Clemente Island, which lies off the coast of San Diego. The waters off San Clemente are a breeding ground for the great white sharks. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, Stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. As Navy SEALs, one of our jobs is to conduct underwater attacks against enemy shipping. We practice this technique ex extensively during training. The ship attack mission is where a pair of SEAL divers is dropped off outside an enemy harbor and then swims well over two miles underwater, using nothing but a depth gauge and a compass to get to the target. During the entire swim, even well below the surface, there is some light that comes through. It is comforting to know that there is open water above you. But as you approach the ship, which is tied to a pier, the light begins to fade. The steel structure of the ship blocks the moonlight. It blocks the surrounding street lamps. It blocks all ambient light. To be successful in your mission, you have to swim under the ship and find the keel, the center line, and the deepest part of the ship. This is your objective. But the keel is also the darkest part of the ship 
where you cannot see your hand in front of your face, where the noise from the ship's machinery is deafening, and where it gets to be easily disoriented, and you can fail. Every SEAL knows that under the keel, at that darkest moment of the mission, is a time when you need to be calm, when you must be calm, when you must be composed, when all your tactical skills, your physical power, and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the run water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down to the Mud Flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up, eight more hours of bone-chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer, and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start singing when you're up to your neck in mud. Finally, in SEAL training, there's a bell, a brass bell that hangs in the center of the compound for all the students to see. All you have to do to quit, all you have to do to quit is ring the bell. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to wake up at five o'clock. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to be in the freezing cold swims. Ring the bell, and you no longer have to do the runs, the obstacle course, the PT, and you no longer have to endure the hardships of training. All you have to do is ring the bell to get out. If you want to change the world, don't ever, ever ring the bell. To the class of 2014, you are moments away from graduating, moments away from beginning your journey through life, moments away from starting to change the world for the better. It will not be easy, but you are the class of 2014, the class that can affect the lives of 800 million people in the next century. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, Step up when the times are the toughest. Face down the bullies. Lift up the downtrodden and never, ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you very much. Hook'em horns.